The Holy Gospel for this first Sunday after the resurrection is from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O God of resurrection, let the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, today we're starting a four-week series on what keeps you up at night, the things that keep you up at night. And today's topic is death. I bet there's not a person in this room who hasn't laid awake at night sometime thinking about your death or somebody else's death or just death in general, wondering a lot and worrying perhaps a little, perhaps a lot. I think that there's so much about death that um, it can be frightening or worrisome. Um, And so I have some quotes about death from other people that I thought would be helpful. This is Woody Allen. I'm not afraid of death, I just don't wanna be there when it happens. (laughs) And then from Marcus Aurelius, this is good advice. Do not act as if you had 10,000 years to throw away. Death stands at your elbow. Be good for something while you live and it is in your power. And then from Khalil Gibran, for death and life are one, even as the river and the sea are one. And finally, I love this Time Magazine cover. Can Google solve death? That would be crazy if it weren't Google. (laughs) Death looks to us as something to be solved, something to fix. Something that if we just get it all right, we know that it's going to happen, but we fret and stew over it as though we're going to make a difference to it happening, right? And, and it's, there's so much about death to worry about. I think we worry about our own death. When will it come? Will it be a surprise? Will we have an illness? If we're ill, we worry about it even more because we wonder if that'll be the outcome of this illness. We worry about death when one of our loved ones or a friend is on the verge of dying or, or is in hospice. We worry about how death will come to them and what it will be like and how will we live without them. And I want to be clear that there's nothing I can say today that's gonna take away the grief and sorrow you feel when a loved one dies. Death is always a tragedy. There are times when it feels like it's okay because someone's really ready, but it doesn't mean we won't miss them. And death always creates a loss. That's the price of loving somebody. But there are things to think about death that change our perspective a little bit. One is that Gibran quote, that life and death are part of the same sea and ocean or or a stream and river, I think it was. That death is a natural part of life. It will come for each of us. We can't avoid it. It won't go away and it will happen. And if we look at it as something that is a natural thing to happen, and then recognize that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we are not at the end of our life when we reach the end of our life, right? The end of this life is only the first step in the next life. The Apostle Paul said it like this, when I am absent from the body, I am present with the Lord. 
just that fast. C.S. Lewis said, you will close your eyes to this life and open your eyes to a new life in a split second. In the twinkling of an eye, with the blink of an eye, your life will be transformed from the mortal to the immortal. And you will be in heaven. And you will be with Jesus. Now we worry about that too, because of course, what proof do we have of that? And, and we talk about it in the faith as the sure and certain promise of the resurrection. The only testimony we really have is people who have had near-death experiences who almost all report a bright light and then at the end of the light they see Jesus or they see some loved ones who've gone before. If you've read the little book Heaven is for Real about the four-year-old boy who had a near-death or death experience, he saw people he loved and people he missed and even people he never met, his grandpa whom he'd never met, um, he saw in heaven and he came back. And, and I think we can trust the, those witnesses mostly because um, they bear out what scripture tells us heaven will be like, right? The scripture tells us that heaven will be a glorious place without sun or moon because God's very self will be the light there. There'll be a beautiful river and a tree of life. And Revelation tells us there'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor any more pain because all of those former things attached to the sin and the life in this world will be gone overcome and overwhelmed by the resurrection promises of God. I've told you about my great niece, Lydia, who uh, is five. My dad died a little more than a year ago. Lydia says, I'm grandpa's girl. That's what she always said when my dad was alive. And she would say, when we would go to Pizza Ranch, she would, um, when she was littler, my dad would take her hand at Pizza Ranch. We do this every Friday, so it was kind of a ritual. And, um, and take her over and help her dish up her chicken and her mashed potatoes and gravy and her corn. The last couple years of my dad's life, when his dementia was fairly significant, Lydia would take my dad's hand and lead him over to the food and say, Grandpa, you like chicken. Grandpa, you like corn. Grandpa, you love mashed potatoes and gravy. And she would help him. Well, ever since my dad has died, every time Lydia sees my mother, I've told you this before, I know, she says to my mother, your husband is dead. <laughs> and my mom is always just a little taken aback. But then she always says, but he's in heaven with Jesus and he's not um, sick anymore and he would not want to come back here. She's very clear about that. But my dad is still alive in her five-year-old memory, which is incredible to me, which reminds me that even death does not wipe us from our family. Our families and friends and loved ones will remember us and will carry us in their hearts. I believe Lydia will carry my dad in her heart till the day she dies. Last week, the, um, the saying changed a little bit, and she just said to my mom, Grandpa kind of fell asleep and went to be with Jesus, didn't he? And my mom said, yes, that is what happened. And of course, that's the kind of death that we all hope for and that, frankly, most of us will have. A quiet passing where at some point, most often, a dying person sees Jesus or an angel um, and, and, um, and they just close their eyes and their breathing changes and they're gone. And that's the kind of death I think that we wish for. But regardless of what kind of death we have, the same thing happens for all of us. We close our eyes and we are not here anymore. We are with Christ. We are physically with the Christ who has been with us every day of our lives. We are with that same one who has loved us, who marked us in the waters of baptism, who chose us and made us his very own. At the last service, and I think maybe last Sunday, we sang a song, Thine is the glory, risen, conquering son, endless 
is the victory you or death have won. Isn't that an amazing reality? Jesus won us victory over death. You heard that in the first Corinthians text, that death, death itself has been swallowed up in victory, that the sting of death, that it's an eternal parting, is no more. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now, as I said, I don't say that to minimize the pain of the loss here. But I say that to say death is not something that we need to fear. God's promise is eternal. And when we talk about the sure and certain promise of the resurrection, we are doing what Pastor Maria admonished us last Sunday to do, which is to trust God's promise. God has promised us eternal life. Every one of us here will have life eternal. That is an amazing gift. Life without pain, without sickness, without sorrow. What an amazing, amazing thing. Knowing that this temporary parting, that death will come and we will open our eyes to a new life, how ought we to live our lives here and now? Well, here's what I think. I think that we ought to live fully in God's promise that Jesus came to give us not only life, but abundant, full, and rich life, and that we ought to live the richest and fullest lives that we can find. Do what feeds your soul. Do what will build good relationships and sustain good relationships. Do the things that your faith asks of you. Feed the poor and the hungry. Be with those who are homeless. Care for those who are in need. Generously live your life, but live it fully and richly. Live it every moment. Packed as full as you want it to be of relationships and things to do, places to go, people to see, Do that, because death will come. Your life here will end this stage and you will start a new phase of life. So live your life here as fully and richly as you can, knowing that someday you will be face to face with Jesus, who will be with you there also forever. Amen.